Mary in her excitement of the news that she has received from Gabriel runs to be with her relative Elizabeth. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what took place. Yes, the subject matter is Mary's praise song. We're going to look at the lyrics to this song and talk about why she was so excited. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description and in the comment section below. Click the link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. For the Kojic Legacy Edition of the Sunday School is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday School lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson as Taught by Pastor Jones. I am the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ, and we're located 1700 West 87th Street, right here in the city of Chicago. If this is your first time, please leave me a comment in the comment section below. If this is your first time, I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School. You can also drop me an email at Rodney Jones. Sunday school at gmail.com, prayer requests, or anything else. Make sure you hit that thumbs up, that like, subscribe, and lastly, hit the bell notification so YouTube will notify you each week. Bing! Brother Jones just uploaded another lesson. And yes, make sure you download your notes. Today's lesson is a very unique one. It is a one, an annual one, actually an annual one, I should say, that we do around this time of Christmas. It is entitled Mary's Praise Song. We're in Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 46 to 56. Very interesting lesson. In this particular lesson, we're going to see uh, what happened in the life of Mary. Why was she so excited? She was so excited until she ran with haste. To be with her, the scripture calls her her cousin. And we talked about on last week, the word for cousin simply means relative. She runs to her senior relative by the name of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is already pregnant. As a matter of fact, by the time angel Gabriel approaches or appears unto Mary, he informs her that her cousin Elizabeth is already six months old or in her term of pregnancy in her old age. Sorry, Elizabeth. Which this gives us two miracles. First, Mary, the mother of Jesus, or who would be the mother of Jesus, was a virgin. And secondly, the fact that her cousin Elizabeth would give birth in her old age and she was also barren. So this lesson takes forth, letting us know Mary's response. And we're going to read the lesson uh, let me talk about first, our topic is Mary's praise song. The Bible truth is Luke 1, 46 through four, uh, 56. And the Bible truth says God invites us to have zeal or real faith in him. He invites us to have real faith in him. The memory verse says, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior, Luke 1 and 47. I'm going to read the entire lesson. It says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in the God of my Savior, in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lower state of his handmaiden. For, behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Hmm. For he that is mighty have done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud 
in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own home. This is the entire reading of our lesson. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word for the edification of our souls. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's get right down to breaking up this lesson and let's see what we can get into. Verse number 46 and verse 47 says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, we're going to talk about, uh, that's the wrong one. I'm already wanting y'all to do some things. <laughs> let, me, let me pull this back up right here. All right, there we go. I had to fix some things. So we're talking about Mary, and there's something that she said. Now, sometimes there can be controversy on whether she's singing this or whether she's saying it. Not going to get into it because to me right now, it's not really important because I want to get to the root and to the meat of the matter. Choose your own battle. Mary says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Interesting is the fact that she called God her Savior. Ah, she can't call Jesus her Savior because he's not born yet. Mm. But we're going to get into, let's see what we can deal with. So after Elizabeth finishes prophesying to Mary, Mary begins to sing or recite the song. The song she sings or recites is called the Magnificat. Her song has what's called three stanzas in it. She praises God for what he has done for her, verses 46 through 49. She sings about what God has done in the life of his people Israel. That's verses 50 through 53. And lastly, she sings of the faithfulness of God in keeping his promise to Abraham. That's verses 54 through 56. When she finished that, then she leaves. So it appears that Mary has a knowledge of the Holy Spirit in her song. She sings about the power of God as it relates to his delivering his people. Number four, she sings or she praises or magnifies the Lord from her soul. She gives a list of reasons why she praises the Lord. And the reasons are full of Old Testament sayings. It's full of Old Testament phrases and praises of the Lord, which is one of the reasons why we believe or I say that she appears to have a knowledge of Old Testament. And that's interesting. A lot of times when we sing, pray, or praise God, it should be full of scripture because God watches over his word. For instance, I can say, Lord, deliver me out of this bondage that I'm in, just like you delivered Israel out of the bondage of, like you pulled Isaiah out, like you pulled David from, like you pulled Daniel from. So I'm really giving God back his word and examples of his word, which I believe touches the heart of God. So not only does Mary soul praise the Lord, but her spirit, she says, delights in God. She speaks with her mouth and her soul and her spirit, or she speaks about her spirit and her soul from her mouth. So Mary is using all that he, she has, it appears, to praise the Lord. Her spirit, her soul, and her body, her body being her mouth. She says that her spirit has rejoiced. Now, there are times that spirit and soul are used interchangeably, here, it can either be used interchangeably or it can be used uh, as what we call Hebrew parallelism. That's when you say the same thing two different ways. I'll go with either way. Yet, when used side by side, 
they can have or bear its own meaning. The next verse explains why her spirit rejoiced in God. And it's interesting, like I said, that she calls him her savior. She says, my soul, the soul deals with the inner man. It is the seat of the affections of man. This is a beautiful place for praises to be because her praises begins or starts uh, from uh, the inner man. It starts from the seat of her affection. She says, my soul magnifies, which means to praise or even to make large. My soul magnifies the Lord. She praises him within and from without with all that she has. And I want to let you know that there are so many uh, things on whether man is tripartite, two parts, or whatever. Man is what we call tripartite, spirit, soul, and body. And you'll find that in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, where Paul says, I pray that your spirit, your soul, and your body. And Mary uses all three to praise God. And not only that, but she said that my spirit uh, has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The, the word for spirit here is the principle of life that resides in man. Spirit is also the breath that was breathed by God into man. And it is the same breath that it returns back to God. She says, my spirit hath rejoiced. The word rejoice means to leap, to exalt, or even to delight. So Mary calls God her savior because he is the God that saves people from their sin. My spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior. Then she gives us the reason why. For he hath. This is what God performed in her life. Mm. He regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. Remember, she called herself on last week. She says, be it unto the handmaiden of God. So he hath caused or regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, from now on, all generations, ladies and gentlemen, everybody. <laughs> is going to call me blessed. Now, they're not going to overdo this because oftentimes we overdo this. But we're going to talk about that. All generations are going to call me blessed. Verses number 49, if you got a cup of coffee, go get your cup of coffee. Come back. We'll be through in just a second. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you may return. For he that is mighty, speaking about God, have done. Notice he's continually performing something to me. Great things and uh, holy is uh, his name. Holy is this name. So this verse speaks of the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. So Mary's prayer of praise is similar to that of Samuel's mother, Hannah. You'll find that in 1 Samuel, the second chapter, verses number one. Her first reason for praising God is because he has regarded the lower state of his handmaiden. Mary calls herself his handmaiden. He looked on the lower state of his handmaiden or the humble condition of his handmaiden. God looked upon the humble, lowly position of Mary and blessed her with the child Jesus. Mary is teaching us that God does not overlook the lowest state of humans. He blesses them because of who he is. And this is why I tell the people of God that praise is your response for what God has done, but worship is your response to who God is. We praise him before, because of what he has done, but we worship him and bow down before him because who he is. If he never does anything, he's still God and he deserves our worship. And she said, because of the babe, Mary will be called blessed from generation to generation. Every generation is going to call Mary blessed or highly favored. They will pronounce her blessed because she is the mother of the Messiah. Psalm 138, 6 says, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. 
She says he has regarded, regarded, which means to look upon, to fix the eye upon, or to look favorably, or even to take notice. He has fixed his eye upon the lower state or the humiliation of the handmaid. A handmaiden is a female servant used by females when addressing a superior. Mary recognizes that she is a person of low estate or of a humble condition or position addressing one who is superior to her. My God, I wish we in the pulpit can bow down before God and recognize that we are not equal nor co-equal to God, but that God is the greatest and we should be considered as the handmaid, the servant, the slave, or whatever our terminology might be. Too often we stand in the pulpit and we act, preach, walk, or pretend, and sometimes believe that we are equal to God. A handmaid or a female slave was the lowest in the Jewish culture for one to be. Mary said God took the lowest position in Jewish culture and made her what she says that she would be called, which is blessed. She is a double position of no honor whatsoever in Jewish uh, custom. Lastly, she lives in Nazareth, which was also looked down. So she was a female, she was a virgin, and she lived in Nazareth, which all of these positions would be a position of lower state in her uh, condition. Scripture also said, somebody says the question in John 1 and 46, can any good thing even come out of Nazareth? So she had so many things that would be moving against her. She says, for behold, from henceforth all generations is going to call me blessed, fortunate, or even prosperous. Each generation. For he that is mighty, he that is mighty, which means powerful, capable, or even strong, uh, have done to me great things, have done, has carried out. He ex executed or he has performed. That's interesting because it takes us back to Genesis 3 and 16. It also places us in Isaiah the 7th chapter, maybe 14th verse. I believe it was around there somewhere where he says, Behold, a virgin is going to give birth. So Mary places herself in this position. She recognizes that she is blessed and God has performed the great things he have uh, 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 have done, which means carried out or even executed. Great things means magnificent. Great things means excellent. Great things mean splendid or even wonderful things. And then holy or hallowed or even separate from common condition in use. Holy, dedicated, pure, and sacred, she says, is his name. This video probably jumped because I was interrupted. I want to bring out something. She says something that's very unique. She mentions that holy, 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 she says, is his name. Now, she doesn't call his name, but says his name is pure, and his name is sacred. His name itself is holy and it's separated from any and all other names. Names are given to describe the character or the characteristic of a person or people as well. If his name is holy, then he himself must be holy. His name represents who he is. He is holy and holy is he. Very good observation, Mary. I love it. He is holy, and yes, holy is who he is. His name is above every name. His character is above every name. He is separate from the common man. There is no unholiness. There is no evil. There is no darkness in him at all. Not only is holy is his name, she says that his mercy is on them that fear him. 
from generation to generation. So not only is each generation is going to speak about her, but uh, she says his mercy is on them, on them. His mercy is on them that fear. Who is the them? Those that fear him from generation to generation. Thank you, Mary, for bringing that out. So this is the second stanza of the song, which goes from verses 50 through 53. This stanza, it speaks about the blessings of God upon his people. This song shows that Mary has biblical knowledge of the power of God according to the Old Testament. She speaks about what God has done for his people Israel in the past. Our songs should be biblically based. Let me say that again. The Lord gives you a song and he puts it in your spirit. That song should line up to scripture. Your song, the lyrics to your words should never contradict scripture because God would never inspire you to sing a song that is not biblically based. The words and the lyrics to what she is either singing or reciting is biblically based. And let's get into it. So our song ought to be biblically sound and based. So verse 49, it speaks of the power of God. Verses 50 speaks of the mercy of God. And not only will all generations call her blessed, but his mercy is upon all of the generations of them that fear him. His mercy is not limited to one nation of people, but unto every generation and every nation that fears him. She says his mercy. The word mercy means his kindness or his goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted. It is joined with the desire to help. So God sees the loss of state of people and his mercy or his kindness is towards them. And then it is joined with a desire to help them. God doesn't just feel sorry for people. His mercy kicks in and it begins to help the people, help pull them out to them that fear or the ones that are in awe of or that revere who reverence and respect. The Bible says in Psalm 147 and 11, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. That's what he takes pleasure in. Verse 51 says, he hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. So Mary shifts praising God for what he has done to her and for her to what he has done for man. Her focus of praise is for what God has done for his people through the scriptures. She's not selfish in her praises and she is thankful to God for his blessing as what he has done to others. We ought to thank God and praise God for how he has uh, uh, captured or pulled out or snatched out or rescued others as well. Too often our praises is personal and private and, uh, you know, selfish. <laughs> he did powerful things with his arm. He has also scattered the proud in the imaginations of their heart. Exodus 3 and 10 says, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. She says he showed, which means to demonstrate. Showed means to make or even to do. He demonstrated his authority. He demonstrated his strength. The word strength here means manifested power or even his might. He not just had strength, but he manifested his strength. So she says he has showed strength with his arm, and the word arm is a symbol of strength. Now, we always mention of the two types of the word for power. I need you to know that there's really three types. Dunamis is ability. It is might and strength. 
Exousia is power, which is right. It is authority and it is permission. But Kratos is power that is manifested. When God manifests his power. See, deutimus means, deutimus means you have the ability to do it. Exousia means that you have the right and permission to do it. But Kratos is when you do it, it is that manifested power. Exodus 15, 16 says, Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Till that people pass over, O Lord till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. She says that he scattered the proud in the imaginations of their heart. The word scatter means to scatter abroad to, or even to disperse. The proud of those who show oneself above the assuming or the haughty or even the arrogant. He scattered the arrogant. They were arrogant in their imagination or in their thoughts or in their understanding or even in their in, intentions. Each nation that rose up against Israel was scattered. You don't believe it? Ask the Assyrians, ask the Egyptians, ask the Babylonians, all of which were scattered because they rose up against his people Israel, whom he loved, crumble and fall. She's not through. And he has put down, put down. Oh my God, he has put down the mighty from their seats and he exalted them of low estate. Ah, he put up one and he put down another. So this shows that God is no respecter of persons. And every person that rose against his people, he took them down. Got to come down. The seat would be the thrones that they ruled in. Every king that exalted himself against Israel was taken down. God took them down from their high position because they rose up against his people. She says he put down, which means to take down or bring down the mighty. The word mighty means the ruler or officer of great authority. And those that exalted, which means lifted of them, he lifted or exalted them of low degree. Low degree would mean the humble. Low degree would mean the lowly or even the, the modest. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, Daniel 5 and 20. Belshazzar was lifted up against the Lord and he got taken down. That's Daniel 5, 23 through 30. And Uzziah's heart was lifted up to his destruction, 2 Chronicles 26 and 16. So God put down kings or great conquerors, and he put up those of low degree. He exalted Daniel, Daniel 2 and 48. He exalted Joseph from the pit, Genesis 41. He exalted Moses, Acts 7 and 35. And he exalted Joshua, Joshua 4 and 14, because he resists the proud and he gives grace unto the humble. That's James 4 and 6. And can't nobody do this but God. But Mary has a knowledge of this. She says he has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He filled the hungry. So Mary goes into a general celebration of the mercy and the actions of God towards those that are hungry. God does not turn the hungry away. He feeds them. He even tells us if your enemy hungers, he says to feed him. He feeds the hungry with good things. The poor come to him for support and he feeds them. The rich approach him with pride and he removes them. Number two, he has sent the rich away empty. The rich approach God with a different agenda and God turns the rich away empty. Their apparent purpose for approaching is to increase their wealth and God turns them away. Their agenda is not to celebrate nor submit, but to gain from him so they can move against those that are not wealthy. He turns them down. This is a demonstration of the justice and the knowledge of God. He has filled the hungry. The word filled means to satisfy. He satisfied the hungry with good things. Good things means the generous or the upright or 
things that are profitable for them. But the rich, those who are bound in or those who have abundantly been furnished with, he sends them away empty, having nothing, empty handed or even vain. That's the type of God. He knows who to turn around. He knows who to bring in. He knows who to put up and he knows who to take down. He has hoping. Look at that word, hoping. Yeah, he hoping his servant. Now watch this. Israel is called his servant. He hoping Israel in remembrance of his mercy right here. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And uh, uh, yes, there it is. I'm going to leave it right there. Cause, yeah, because something happened and we ain't going to worry about that. So Israel here is called the servant of the Lord. God chose them for himself to be a people for himself. Exodus 19 through 20. His original name was Jacob. But when Jacob wrestled with God through the angel, the angel changed his name from uh, Jacob to Israel. That's Genesis 32 and 28. God helped Israel in remembrance of his mercy. His mercy that he remembered is actually the covenant that he made with Abram in Genesis 17 and 19. I need somebody to know God may appear not to be there, but God never forgets his covenant that he made. He may have made a covenant with your great, great grandmother. And believe me, God is not just a covenant maker, but he's a covenant keeper and he brings covenants to pass. We allow stuff to happen or stuff happen to us. We have no control, but God makes covenants and he causes the covenant to come to pass. He is a covenant keeper. Yes. So he had hoping or holding, I should say. Yeah, holding. I got in there hoping, but it is holding, holding. The word hoping or holding means to aid, to assist or to take hold as if by the hand and support it. He literally took Israel by the hand and walked them through because of the covenant or the mercy that he had given upon Abram. He says mercy, which is compassion. It is kindness or even goodwill. The word mercy is used here to denote the covenant that he made with Abram. He has holding Israel by the hand so to keep Israel from falling. God held him up in remembrance of his covenant he made with Abram, Genesis 12. Yeah, he literally took Israel by the hand, holding, and held him up and preserved him. So Mary and Joseph are from the house of David. That's Luke 1 and 27. Israel was a people that was chosen by God to bring forth his son, Genesis 22 and 18. And God preserved and held Israel due to his covenant with Abram. Genesis 22 and 18, because his son would come through. And so Mary is singing or reciting some powerful biblical stuff that we see that God has done it. He did this as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. So this promise in the lesson is coming, is the coming of the Lord who will save all nations. Genesis 22 and 18. Throughout the journey of Israel, God guided them each step. Now, the word forever is a connection to the remembrance of his mercy. He made this covenant with Abraham, Genesis 22 and 18. She said, fathers. He made the covenant with Isaac, Genesis 26 and 4, fathers. And he made the covenant with Jacob, Genesis 28 and 14. So my brothers and sisters, you have Abraham, you have Isaac and Jacob. She says, he spake to our fathers and to his seed forever. And then the lesson says, what happened to Mary, ladies and gentlemen, she abode, uh, which means she dwelt and she lived with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, I'm not sure if the fact that Mary was there until the birth of Elizabeth's son, John, who was the forerunner of Jesus, who's the relative of Jesus, and who would be six months older than Jesus. We do know that the scripture says that when Elizabeth was pregnant, she hid herself for about five months, I believe the scripture says. And then in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel came to Mary to let her know that your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant with a son and she's going to give birth. 
And Mary takes and runs shortly after the good news and goes and greets uh, and celebrates with her cousin Elizabeth. The scripture says when she did that, the babe leaped in the womb of Elizabeth and Elizabeth was full of the Holy Ghost. I need you to recognize the term is full and not baptized. She was full because the Bible says that John would be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, not baptized because baptism didn't take place until after Jesus' ascension. So when we get to the opening of this lesson, Mary has already ran to the house of Elizabeth and Elizabeth began to prophesy to Mary first and then our lesson opens up with Mary now uh, either reciting or singing a song which is full of prophecy and everything else. Those of you that like to support this channel, there it is. Know that whenever you support, support this channel, you're supporting the kingdom, you're supporting the ministry, because this is not just Sunday school for me. I always reach out. I support other works of the Sunday schools, other people. I do not just church work, but kingdom work. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what denomination you are a member of. I am Church of God in Christ, but I don't care what denomination you are of, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're hungry, if I have it, I'm going to feed you. Come on, somebody. So I thank you, and I'm thankful to the Lord, uh, and look for these lessons to be now on the earlier part of the week. Lord said the same. If the creek don't rise, if the Lord delay is coming, and if I don't oversleep, I pray that I'll see you all Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for the live stream. Remember my motto, make sure you like, subscribe, leave comments to this lesson, and share this lesson. Uh, teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence and the model of the Sunday school, a child saved is a soul saved, plus a life. Amen. Amen.